Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Asiri, and each week I meet with military veterans to learn about their civilian career, what it is they do, how they got there, and advice for other veterans who want to do the same. Today's episode number 245 with UFC's Liz Carmouche. They give us a sign that it's time to get warmed up. I get warmed up, everything goes away, all jokes are done. It's now about focusing on the end goal and what I'm trying to achieve. And the walkout is uh, really when the switch just turns. Just going out there, getting backstage, you wanna not get too get too hyper and get too excited for the fight. You don't wanna exude any energy that doesn't need to be met. And really when I go through the threshold and I cross through and I see all the fans and I see the cage, that's when I know exactly what it is I need to do. And that's when really the whole like tunnel focus comes into play. And once I get it in that cage close, it's just time to give everything I have. Well, this is one of my favorite episodes to date. Liz is such an incredible example of determination and resilience. In this interview, she talks about what led her just one month before her 26th birthday, uh, which is later than life than most people, to start MMA. We We talk about commitment and putting your mind and heart into whatever you do. We talk about how she prepares for a fight how she takes her head out of a fight to save energy, and what it's like recovering, especially from failures in a fight. We also talk about what it's like to be thrust as an introvert into the public spotlight. She talks about her weekly schedule, which is insane, and we talk about what it took to get her to this point in her career. Regardless of whether or not you're interested in a career in sports or the MMA, there is something great in this interview for you. As always, at beyondtheuniform.io, you'll find show notes with a text transcript of this interview, thanks to Kathleen Dillon. You'll also find over 244 other episodes just like this. And you'll also find information about Beyond the Uniform's coaching program, where you can be connected to a subsidized and certified career executive coach to help you figure out your next career move whether that's figuring out whether or not to get out of the military or figuring out whether you need to move on to another job if you've been out for a while. There is uh, a lot of great things happening there. Excited to share more in a podcast soon. I mean it this time. Uh, So with that, let's dive in to my interview with Liz Carmouche. Well, joining me today in San Diego, California is Liz Carmouche. Liz, welcome to Beyond the Uniform. Thank you for having me. And a special thanks to Prime Hall for connecting us. Um, I wanted to give listeners a very quick background on Liz. Uh, Liz, a.k.a. Gorilla Carmouche, is a mixed martial artist fighter uh, who currently competes for UFC in the women's flyweight division and is currently ranked number six in the flyweight division. Uh, She was the first openly lesbian fighter in the UFC. And she served in the Marine Corps as an aviation electrician for five years, during which she did three tours of duty in the Middle East. Um, So, Liz, maybe to to start things off, especially for those listening who are on active duty right now, could you share a little bit about your process leaving the Marine Corps and what your first job search was like? Yeah, my uh, initial process getting in the Marine Corps, I started the job hunt about six months prior to getting out in the ASA. And I spent another good six, eight months afterwards searching for jobs and finding absolutely no success whatsoever. Um, It was uh, one of the reasons that I volunteered to go out and extend my contract one more time was to do one more tour to Iraq to be able to save up enough money to support the idea that um, I'd already found that I wasn't having any success searching for jobs. So just on the possibility that I wouldn't have the the funds to continue that, uh, I saved up. And uh, much to my dismay, it was exactly that. I got out and could not find a job. I, there was a lot of pyramid schemes going out there, but uh, it just seemed like there was no hope for actually getting a job. So I ended up utilizing the GI Bill and going to school full time. Well, I mean, first of all, you're more prepared than most of the people I've had on the show. And, you know, you were thinking about this six months in advance, which was great. And you, that gave you that time to extend. And I think it's also... Um, 
a trend in the 240 other interviews like this I've done where um, I think a lot of people in the military are surprised at the difficulty of obtaining a job. And I think the expectation is kind of set that you're going to get out, everyone's going to want to hire you and you're taken care of. And that's not always the case. And I, I would say the vast majority of interviews I've done for the podcast, it's not the case. And so it's nice that you were able to build up a little bit of a buffer financially to, to have a little bit of time to figure out exactly what, what you wanted to do. And um, I was curious about, like, what what led you to mixed martial arts? What like when did that start for you? Uh, so when I was in, uh, everybody had AFN, and on AFN, one of the things that they did that was really awesome is they would play strike force fights for free. Whereas like the UFC, you have to have certain channels for it, you have to pay for pay per view. Strike force just offer that on their the common channel that everybody else would play. Um, so I started getting into it then, and at first was really kind of opposed to it, but was getting really sick and tired of just running and lifting weights all the time. It's just the monotony was wearing me down. A lot of people suggest that I get into MMA and started doing the workouts in Iraq because I just didn't have the possibility to actually go train with the gym and go, go work with the team. So I started doing the workouts and really loved the conditioning that I was getting for my body, the diets that they were offering through some of the books I was reading. And as I started to watch and become more of a fan of MMA, I really just, I, what I actually envisioned was fighting against Chris Cyborg at 145, having no idea that I was way too tiny for that. <laughs> uh, but that was my dream, was, was to, to go against her. And then in one of my first strike force fights, I actually saw her. I was like, oh, yeah, you know, definitely not a 145-er. Never going to fight her. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that's, that's, uh, interesting. I, I, you know, I thought kind of coming into this, I wasn't sure if this was something you had like thought of your whole life, but it, it sounds like it was really just, it started almost with fitness and then turned into something you enjoyed and appreciated even more. Um, what was the point at which, or, or was there like a specific point in time where you thought, you know what, I'm going to actually, I'm going to go for this. I'm going to have this be part of my career. Uh, believe it or not, I actually took into well into my career before I finally thought that I deserved to be in the division. There was a lot of circumstances that would happen where I felt like it was just pure luck where I was given these opportunities and able to succeed in those. Um, from getting into strike force to having an opportunity where I'd only been training for eight months to fight for the world title. And I would say that it was really after fighting Marlos Koning and going in as, as such the underdog that nobody anticipated I would exit out of the first 20 seconds of the first round, <laughs> let alone make it to the fourth round. And um, so thinking that I could go toe to toe with the veteran that I had watched fight and I looked up to so much and be able to hold my own is really what convinced me that I actually belong to be in this sport and to really pursue it and give everything I have. So uh, I got my associate's degree, decided I was done with school. It was not my thing. I did my time. It helped me do what I needed to do to train full time and, and to uh, have the income to be able to do that and pursue that. So once I had my associates and that was done, I fully committed to training and making that my entire life. That's, that's so wild. Was that, I mean, first of all, I admire that, um, I admire that you like did school and you're like, this isn't for me and you were willing to move on. I, I think a lot about lately about the number of things that I do and that people do just to see something through, which I don't think there's a lot of value in that. It's like, figure out, get the information, figure it out, move on as quickly as possible. So I love that. But yeah. I'm, I'm just, I'm just, um, kind of in awe of like the, you know, the jumping off. And was that, was there a lot of like sleepless nights about this? Was it a clear decision of like, okay, I'm going to do this. Was there people trying to talk you out of it or, or what was that like in the moment of making that decision? I uh, know. I think it was really something that I just did subconsciously with myself and really just weighing all the life decisions uh, I knew when I got out of the Marine Corps that school wasn't for me. I'd heard everybody talk about the GI Bill, and uh, I'd gone to college before I joined the Marine Corps, and that's one of the reasons where I was like, okay, you know what? I, I need to stop trying to do school. College is my deal. Let me just join the Marine Corps. It's ultimately what I wanted to do anyway, so let's stop postponing it and getting in. And when I got out, I was like, okay, well, the GI Bill at least gives me the flexibility, where as long as I just make all the classes in the morning and I'm able to do all my homework, do all, all my assignments, maintain a certain GPA, I can spend the whole rest of the afternoon and evening training for six hours a day. And uh, that's what I was doing was balancing. I mean, every, every time I even went to fights, I took my school books with me and I was writing papers and turning in assignments or doing tests online. So I was never actually relaxing in fight week. And of course, uh, anyone can attest that, that that takes its toll and it kind of is a very tiring process. 
And uh, there's definitely certain points where I just wanted to be done with it, where taking a whole suitcase full of textbooks was exhausting. <laughs> and I didn't want to do it anymore. Like trying to concentrate on a, a textbook when all I want to do is envision the fight and go off and do other things just wasn't for me. Uh, but I knew that um, just with the, the climate, with the way that the, the workforce was here in San Diego, in California, in the United States, I knew that at the minimum I had to have my associate's degree. Uh, I mean, only later to find out that really to have a job and function in California, you really need your bachelor's. But um, I thought, I'm like, okay, well, at least I can come out of it saying that I accomplished something. I can't leave school without actually finishing here. And I'd uh, originally gone in hoping that I could get my um, personal training certificate and use that and just that just wasn't working out. Um, and it was, it was just more of one of those nights where I had such a, a strong workload for school and I'm balancing that with like a nine day notice fight and trying to um, be really concentrating my energy on both. I'm making sure that I'm as prepared as possible for this fight, but also trying to meet the expectations for school without compromising either of the two. And having to balance that all the time was really difficult. And I was really fortunate that uh, Bill Crawford offered me a job at the gym that I now own and operate. Um, had he not given me that opportunity, I probably would have kept using the GI Bill, being miserable doing it, trying to balance the two, and unsure if I really belonged to MMA. But it was um, him giving me that chance and really seeing something in me that I didn't see in myself and allowing me an opportunity to get a job there where I could just commit my entire life to fighting. And that's what helped cement that decision for me. That's so awesome. I, there's so much of, I love about what you just said, but I love this image of you getting this workout, dragging this suitcase full of textbooks to a fight. It just <laughs> really paints the picture of um, burning the candle at both ends. And just I, I can only imagine how crazy of a schedule that must have been. What was it like? So you, you meet Bill and he offers you this um, the job at the gym. What was your life like at that point? Like, Could you take us through what a typical day was like for you? Yeah, once I swapped over and I was uh, working full-time, it really consisted of I would open up the gym at 5.30 in the morning. And so I would open up the gym. I'd be there about 5 o'clock in the morning, and my shift would be over at around noon. So then I could go home, I could eat, do laundry, clean my house, uh, kind of relax a little bit, and then I headed to the gym. And from about 3 o'clock until it closed at 9 p.m., I was training all day, taking as many classes as I could, just trying to catch up. Because I started later in life. I started a month before my 26th birthday. And in terms of MMA, when you don't have a martial arts background, that's a really, a really late time, late bloomer <laughs> getting into the sport um, and a mist of veterans that had been doing some type of martial arts since they were four and five. And here I was coming into it at 26, trying to give everything I had. So I knew that I had a lot of ground to make up. So I didn't take any days off. I mean, even if I was sick, I can remember one of the times I, I was booked for a fight and I was months out. So I had plenty of time to, to relax if I wanted to but I had food poisoning and I'd been texting Bill and I'm like, Hey, uh, I'm not really feeling that great. I'm not sure I was going to do it. He's like, and he was just giving me a hard time. It's just what he does. And he knows me. He's like, you know, what? Hey, if that's what you want to do, then that's your decision. I'm like, wait, what? Don't be like that. <laughs> okay. I'm on my way. <laughs> and so I was like running to the bathroom, running back to the weights, back and forth, just trying to hold in, not being sick the entire time. And um, I think when he saw that my commitment to be there and that even if I was sick and dying, that I was going to put in the work and train, um, showed him that he was going to, he was willing to do the same sacrifices. And so after that, he really took me under his wing and started helping strength conditioning and striking, um, helped me with my own nutrition and, uh, just getting more and more opportunities at the gym that allowed me to really stick with this. It's, it's just so wild. I mean, this is what you do for a living is so outside my normal day to day. And I'm just, you know, my only context I have is like Rocky and I'm just picturing the grizzled guy, Bill in the corner, like just kind of watching you and seeing that determination. Were, were you always like that? Like growing up, were you someone who just, just committed and latched on and was just, just unable to shake off things? Or was this, did this come about through uh, uh, MMA or where, where did that come from? I think as a, as a child and, and coming up, I think that was certainly a part of who I was. Uh, but at the time, I was convinced that I could do anything and everything. So I would uh, pursue everything on a whim. So one day I wanted to be an astronaut. So I was doing all this research and I was trying to be an astronaut. The next day I wanted to be a professional soccer player. Then the day after that, a gymnast. And then I wanted to be a stunt double. So, um, and it was always a, like fully pursuing all those, but uh, my commitment to all of them wasn't there. I was just too much of a whimsical person and unsure of who I wanted to be. 
but one thing that was really consistent was my work ethic and everything. I've been, I've been working since I was 12 and uh, while everybody else is like partying and having good times and hanging out with their friends on the weekends, I was working two to three jobs over the course of a weekend. And while everybody else is like, Oh, I'm on summer break. I'm like summer break. That means I can work four jobs and make and save up the most money for the rest of the year. <laughs> Cause I paid for my, cause I had to pay for like my bus to get to and from school, which is $7 and 20 cents one way. Um, we lived far away from the school that I went to. So I had to pay for the bus to and from, and then um, had to pay for the insurance to be able to play sports. And I bought my own car for myself. So there's all those things that I was very independent and wanted to make sure that everything I did was of my own accord and everything that I worked for, I worked for. Everything that, that was mine was something that I knew that I was able to achieve on my own. And I think that really came from my mother and in raising independent women. And then just through the Marine Corps is what really taught me to focus on one thing and commit everything I had to it. I, I think it's, there's so many things inspiring about what you just said, but I, I, I really like, there's something, for some reason, I really like in your story, it, there's something that's appealing to me, not that this was like a dream you had from childhood. It was, you know, you had this work ethic and you had this attitude, but it, my sense is you didn't really know what you wanted to do, which is the way I think it is for the vast majority of people listening to this podcast, it's definitely the way it was for me. There, I was not one of those kids who knew at age five what I wanted to do. I think those people still piss me off. It's, uh, you know, it's like, and I think most, I yeah, most people I talk to in the military don't have a clue. And there's so much pressure to figure it out. And there's so much pressure to get it right. And I love that um, it's just inspiring to see that you come to a sport later in life than, than it sounds like most people come to it and you're still able to put in the time and effort to to rise to the top. I think that's, I hope listeners, whether they're interested in uh, sports in general or any career, realize that the power of that, that you're able to, through through sheer force of will and determination and commitment to, to, to pursue something that otherwise might seem outlandish. Um, no, absolutely. And I think that, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. I know, and that really was uh, when I talk to, like, when I have young kids in my MMA program, one of the things that they'll ask me for is what advice I can give them. And it's that just to put their mind and their heart to whatever it is that anybody's capable of anything. There's one thing I learned is that if I can start in this sport at such a, an old age and have the success that I have, that really, if anything's possible, if they just set their mind to it. And that's one thing that I've learned through my pursuits in the Marine Corps, through fighting, and through all the adversity I face. I love that. I, um, yeah, I think it's great that you're able to interact with, with kids like that, too. I think what a great role model for them to have. And I, I think that that's atypical to what I see as like a prevailing notion now, which is around Instagram. You know, it's like you see people who appear to, to just kind of strike it big instantly and with seemingly little yeah. effort. And that's just a, a, cuck, a kick to the guts in terms of just feeling like demotivating for me. But I love the story of like, you know, putting, like you said, putting your mind and heart to, to really pursue something and, and that you can achieve anything, but it's not like it's handed to you. It's not like it just happens. Absolutely. What, um, what is your typical day like for you now? Like, is it still the same or, or, I mean, what, what, yeah, could you just walk us through a random day? Yeah, in so many ways, it's actually a lot more crazy. Uh, I'm married with a three-year-old, and mm. um, he very much has the energy that I have, and that is some. It's, it's like he's tapped to an outlet. And when you see them <laughs> as a child, they don't have any other responsibilities. They don't have any other thought process in their mind other than just enjoying their life and really just absorbing everything. So they really are tapped to an endless amount of energy, and you just go, go, go. And there are points where, like, I look at my son, I'm like, oh, he just never stops. And, of course, my wife would be like, okay, you just went to the gym for four hours. You came home, did more cardio. You took him swimming and ran him around the pool, and then you're going back to work for another six-hour shift. Where do you think he gets from? Like, well, I mean, when you put it like that, all right, I, I guess. <laughs> uh, so my mornings usually consist of uh, he wakes up usually between 6 or 7 in the morning. He's our built-in alarm clock. and not have to worry about setting an alarm clock. He comes and knocks on the door happily asking us to get up, feed him and play with him. Uh, so then after that, we usually like split the responsibilities of making the breakfast, getting everybody ready. And then we try and set aside time just to have a little bit of family time without our phones, hang out with him. She usually takes him to daycare and then I head straight to the gym and it's a full morning of training. And I spend usually all morning training. Then my lunch break is trying to meet up with them and spend some more time with them, whether it's going to the park or taking him to swim and trying to build his confidence there. 
uh, taking care of all the gym responsibilities for mom running errands, stocking up the gyms, doing inventories. And then it's right back to the gym where I'm uh, working from usually about three until 9 p.m. at night. And if in there, if I can get some additional training, I do. Then I get home, feed him his good night or uh, give him his good night books, hang out with him a little bit. And I uh, usually come home, jump on my spin bike, do some more cardio, and then right back to it the next day. That's just insane. <laughs> is that is that <laughs> is that it like that on the weekend too? Uh, on the weekend, it's actually a little bit crazier. Because <laughs> uh, on the weekends, it's the same thing. He's he's up early on Saturdays. Like he doesn't it doesn't matter. He doesn't understand the concept of sleeping in yet. So we're like, no, come on, just give us a few more minutes. It doesn't exist <laughs> in this world. Uh, so Saturdays is kind of give and take on whether or not I'll go to the gym and do like a 7 a.m. wrestling class. And um, my wife also come in. He just goes and plays with, with other people while we do wrestling. And then it's usually heading to, so we have some other locations. So I'll go check out the other locations, do some morning training, work at the gym, uh, or head to uh, UTL and go do some swimming up at uh, San Clemente or Oceanside. And then we usually try and take the weekend to do activities with him. But that can also mean that I have responsibilities for the gym that have to be met, whether it be just catching up on paperwork, uh, doing phone calls, uh, taking care of the things that need to. Like our gym flooded the other day, so we had to, we spent the weekend trying to fix that. <laughs> so every day is, is pretty crazy. And and what is it like? Do you have like a routine prior to a fight night, or could you kind of take us backstage for what's going on with you before? you are surrounded by these fans and locked up in a cage. Yeah. So uh, just depending on, on the actual fight night itself and what's going on, like different, different events will have us different requirements for the time that we have to be there. Uh, one of the events I had to be there six hours ahead. Other times it's just two hours. So just depending on that, we'll make some variations, but usually it's me just trying to just sleep in as late as possible and just make sure I'm as well rested. And then it's just getting up and usually taking my head out of the fight. Because my my biggest issue is that I picture the fight in Mortal Kombat finishes. Like, I'm jumping up on her, ripping her head out with the spine dang. I mean, literally, Mortal Kombat finishes. So I have to kind of take my head away from the fight and not think of these crazy finishes and stuff. And trying to distract myself with watching Food Network, which is usually the thing I do all fight camp. is endless Food Network. <laughs> and the benefits of being in a hotel room is they have multiple food channels, so it's great. <laughs> That's awesome. So... I'm usually uh, playing video games, uh, like I'll bring my PS3 and I'll play my PS3 while I also have my laptop open on the Food Network just to have as many distractions as possible. Uh, I'll bring my guitar and strum some horrible car chords <laughs> painfully to anybody that's around. Mm -hmm. And I uh, usually hang out with my coaches and we just kind of, just for big jokesters, it's just usually keeping it light. And then when we head to the venue, I usually just lay around backstage and try and stay off my phone as much as possible. Uh, because really the thing I always have to do is just manage my energy and make sure that I'm not getting amped up before the fight. Mm. So I usually put the phone away and just hang out with them, and we joke around, and it's just a lot of laughter backstage until they give us a sign that it's time to get warmed up. I get warmed up. Uh, everything goes away. All jokes are done. It's now about focusing on the end goal and what I'm trying to achieve, and the walkout is uh, really when the switch just turns. Just going out there, getting backstage, you want to not get too – get too hyper and get too excited for the fight because you don't want to exude any energy that doesn't need to be met. And really when I go through the threshold and I cross through and I see all the fans and I see the cage, that's when I know exactly what it is I need to do. And that's when really the whole like tunnel focus comes into play. And once I get in that cage close, it's just time to give everything I have. What, uh, man, there's so many different questions I want to ask, but I'm, I'm just curious <laughs> What it, what it's like to, well, I guess maybe these two things are blended together. So apologies for kind of long-winded question, but part of what I'm curious about is what it's like to be in one of the few things that I can think of where it is so binary, like you win or lose a fight and you're in there on your own. And there's not a lot of jobs that I know of where it is so clear cut. And and then the the second part is just, it's so public, like people are watching you on TV. Like when I was getting ready for our interview, there's every single stat about your life, your weight, your height, your fights, <laughs> like, like everything you do is watched and tracked. And I'm just kind of curious how you adjust to that and, and what that's like to, to live through that. Yeah, and that, that took a lot of adjustment because I'm, I'm very much an introvert. 
and I really like my privacy. And it's not that there's things to hide. It's really just, I like having my sanctuaries and my spots where it's just nice and quiet. I'm just a very introverted person. So one of the most exhausting things is fight week because I'm going out and you have to do meet and greets and, and that drains me every day because I prefer just to stay in my room and just kind of lock away the world or go see the, the area that I'm visiting and I'm fighting in. And that's really what I have to do is just manage that energy and kind of refocus and recommit back to myself every day and recenter myself because it is so exhausting. And uh, that's been probably one of the more difficult things to adjust to with the whole fame and with fighting is I, I didn't necessarily have the expectation that all of that would, would come across. And it really did happen after that Marlowe's Conan fight. That was a, a huge marker and life changer for me in so many ways. So I remember coming back from that fight and going to the grocery store and being in line like, holy, you're, wait, you're Liz Carmouche. Didn't you fight this weekend? And I'm like, <laughs> is, is there another Liz Carmouche behind? Oh, you're looking at me. Oh, yeah. And then somebody else, like, that just ignited somebody else. And I'm like, wait, wait, the strike force? I saw that this weekend. I'm like, oh, God, what's going on? This, I go to this grocery store all the time. I think, I think something's wrong with this grocery store. I need to go somewhere else. And everybody was great. It was just not something that I was expecting, especially after your first fight week when it's a lot of media build up for it. You're going on a media tour. And when that's something new to you to also come home and a place where I'm just going and I'm having, like, I don't want these people to see that I'm, I'm eating tons of nasty food because I've been so disciplined. Like they don't need to see my cart right now. It's ice cream and junk food. Like this is super embarrassing. That's <laughs> and, awesome. Uh, so, so that was weird for me. Cause I have these people who like, they shake my hand like, Oh, it's so nice to meet you. And, and they're talking and, um, and then they walk away and you're like, wait, but meet you. Like you didn't, you didn't even tell me your name and they're gone. And you're like, that was certainly one sided where people just stopped in front of you. And they're like, Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. I'm like, Oh, what, what's going on? And then just walk away and you're like, Oh, okay. What just happened? I don't understand what just happened. <laughs> uh, so, so that's been really weird. Or even um, hearing people that I've touched their lives, and these are people I've never even met before, and to think that I can inspire them to anything, that uh, to me is always a huge surprise because I didn't see myself being that person and being able to make any changes in anybody's life, and especially for the positive. I didn't think that I could be that person to inspire others. That's so awesome. What about... Um... Because I'm just like you, I'm very introverted as well. I think that it would be very difficult for me having that public scrutiny. Um, could you talk about the experience of, of coming out and being the the, uh, the first person, I believe, in the UFC to to be an open lesbian, openly lesbian fighter? Yeah. Um, so another thing where I just was a late bloomer was coming out. I uh, didn't really come out, so I was 22, but I was still active in the Marine Corps, and it was during Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And not only during Don't Ask, Don't Tell, but my command in particular was very, very much opposed to it. Um, I know that our sister command that was right next door, they had a woman who was out, and everybody knew it, and there was everybody just kind of was like an unspoken, let's protect her, not say anything. Uh, whereas in my command, they're like, oh, I wish that somebody would come out. It would be a witch hunt, and we'd um, put them out in the stake for everybody to uh, get rid of them. So I was like, oh, okay, I'm just now coming to light with this and kind of figuring myself out. And so that was really difficult doing that in the Marine Corps because don't ask, don't tell. And so here I am like starting to discover myself, but not actually having the ability to go out and to meet people or to network and talk to other people because the community I grew up in Japan, you don't see um, public shows of affection and you certainly don't see openly out people walking around. You don't even really see couples holding hands and stuff. There just is no PDA. And to then come to the United States, but being in the Marine Corps during that time, it was just kind of like the same thing, but on such a more negative light of it. So when I got out of the Marine Corps, I was like, you know what, I'm done. Like living my whole life and that whole time in the Marine Corps in fear, looking over my shoulder every time. We're not knowing because I can remember uh, a staff sergeant that ran one of the shops had said that he was going to go out to Hillcrest and go on a witch hunt to find any any uh, Marines that were out there so he could out them and get them kicked out of the military. And being like, oh, I hang out in Hillcrest. So taking like back alleys so I wouldn't be seen and hiding in shadows when I'm dating a woman. And it was really difficult. So I knew that after I got out of the Marine Corps, that was never something I wanted to go through ever again. So if that meant that it would compromise situations and opportunities in my life, then that's fine. Cause I'd rather do that being open than ever do it with fear. And while I didn't see any negativity firsthand, I did hear from, uh, I had a management team that wanted me to downplay the fact that I was gay. I was like, okay, I'm not going to do that. In fact, I have a rainbow mouthpiece and I'm going to wear it. And so one to get a different mouthpiece, I'm like, I'm not doing that. 
they want me to put on hair, makeup, and a dress. I'm like, and wear heels. I'm like, I've never worn heels in my life. I tried wearing heels. <laughs> I almost broke my ankle. It was super embarrassing. Like, can you put on makeup? I'm like, I don't know. And I don't I own makeup. I don't know how to do any of this. Um, so that was really the closest I saw it firsthand. And then hearing from them that I lost out in some fight opportunities because um, they just didn't want that in the fight organization or losing on sponsorships because they didn't want anybody that was advocating for being openly out. And I, I certainly wasn't going out to represent the LGBTQ community. I really just wanted to be honest and true to myself and not hide who I was. I never wanted to shove anybody's face. I just wanted to be true to who I was and not hide in the shadows anymore. And what that ended up turning into is kind of being a spokesperson for the LGBT community as a representative for MMA. That's so awesome. I, mean, I just admire the resilience and the, um, there's just so much resilience in your story of, of that. And just uh, what I view as kind of a, an awful experience in the Marine Corps, as opposed to that sister company that, that was much more accepting and supportive. But, but the, it's just wild for me to think of your life because it's like the, the determination you show every single day and showing up, the determination you show in a fight, the determination you show through everything. C- could, you, could you just talk about um, what is it like? I mean, I, I can only imagine what it's like in the fights that you win. What about like the, the fights that you lose? How do you recover from that? And I'm just kind of thinking, you know, even for p- listeners who are not going to go in this, this line of work, just giving them thoughts of like how to recover from failure, which we all face no matter what our career path is. Uh, so one of the big things that, that I've always done is I try to, if I fight on Saturday, I'm back in the gym and Monday, even if I'm, I'm too beat, beat up to participate in practice, I want to show not only the support that I have for my team, but just to reassure them that in a loss, it doesn't change my drive to learn and grow. And that's one of the things I've always tried to show my teammates and, and show my coaches too, is that, I may have lost, but I'm, I'm coming back hungry and wanting to learn from my mistakes and learn from things I did correctly as well. So Mondays, I'm always back in the gym in one format or another. If I'm not too beat up from the fight, then I'm right back to training, trying to work on every little mistake that I made to make sure it never happens again and to redefine the fighter that I am and to learn from the mistakes to grow in a better way instead of letting those weigh me down and hold me back from being the best fighter I can be. That's, that's incredible. What advice do you have if someone listening is maybe on active duty right now and they aspire to professional sports or, or the MMA in, uh, MMA in particular, what advice do you have for them about pursuing that as a career path? I'd say that it's absolutely possible. I mean, if I can do it, I certainly believe that there are many other military personnel and many other people that can do it themselves. I think the biggest hindrance that we have is our own boundaries that we set for ourselves that hold us back. It's not even the other people outside of our lives because they can say negativity, but it's us absorbing it and making it our own negativity. It really holds us back. So as long as they believe that they can pursue something, if they give it all they have, they can absolutely achieve it. That's awesome. And um, one other question I had was, is there any, um, resources and and by that I mean like a a book a podcast a conference anything that that a listener today could go take action on that you would recommend to listeners interested in this as a career path I'd say if they're interested in in MMA as a career path then really what they can do is find the fighters that they look up to the most find who it is what whether it happens to be their heart when they're fighting or the style that they like whatever it is and find a team that can help you represent that and just pursue it with everything you have. I was fortunate that the gym just happened to be really close to my house. It was about a mile away from when I first lived in San Diego. So I was able to find the team that I connected with the most that accepted me. And as a result, they helped me from day one. Like that's the first time I ever trained as one I'm still with. And they've helped me to the point I'm at my career and will only further do that because I found a sense of family and acceptance and we all grow together. And my advice to them would just be find somebody that you connect with that wants you to be the best version of you. Awesome. Well, I always like to keep the last question open-ended and I'll just preface this by saying, I I just, I think you're so awesome. I think that your story is so incredible and um, you're humble about it, but it's, it's, you are operating at a, an extreme level and, um, 
I just love your story of determination and I admire your commitment to staying true to yourself. I just think that there's so much in this interview for everyone to learn from. But for the last question, I always like to keep it open-ended, which is um, what have we not covered today that you want to make sure listeners know before we wrap up? Huh, something we haven't covered. <laughs> um, I think that I would do a disservice to my gym if I didn't speak to um, some of the things I've gotten from them. I mean, I've made some markers in history, but it came from having the team and having the leaders that I have. Like everything I've accomplished, while it is absolutely um, a one-person sport, when you step into the octagon, it takes a team to actually get to that point. And because of them, I've been able to make those markers. I came out as the first woman in, in MMA that was openly gay. And I got to experience the first ever female UFC fight. And again, with my team, they, they helped lead me to be one of the first 10th planet female black belts and the first 10th planet female black belt freak. And it's just all these things that are done because of the leadership that I have and support I have in that gym. Awesome. Well, for listeners, you can find more information about Liz on the show notes for this episode, including a link to her Wikipedia page. I think it's pretty cool that you've got a Wikipedia page, by the way. Um, <laughs> but uh, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me, Liz, especially now knowing the craziness of your schedule. The, uh, the time you blocked off for us to be able to chat is, it means a lot. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of Beyond the Uniform. There are over 200 free episodes at beyondtheuniform.io. They're classified by the industry of focus, the functional role the person plays, and more. Beyond the Uniform is hosted, produced, and edited by me, Justin Asiri. Our director of outreach, responsible for sponsorship and guest episodes, is Steve Bain. Our editor, responsible for the show notes and text transcripts for all episodes, is Kathleen Dillon. Our data analytics and insights advisor is Andrew Woolridge. If you are enjoying Beyond the Uniform, you can help us out by telling your veterans and friends in the military about this free resource. There is more information on the website about how you can sponsor an episode or donate to our program to help us grow the work that we're doing. Be sure to check out the coaching section of beyondtheuniform.io where you can be paired with professional, subsidized coaches to help you figure out your next career move. You can sign up for our newsletter to be up to date on the latest happenings at Beyond the Uniform. And in each show notes section, there is a link to audible.com, which is providing a free audiobook of your choice to Beyond the Uniform listeners. You get a free book of your choosing, and Beyond the Uniform gets $15 to subsidize the cost of the show, regardless of whether you can continue with audible.com or not. Check that out and more in the show notes for this episode. Keep the feedback coming. Let me know what resources would help you in your career, and we'll do our best to make that happen. Take care, be safe, and I'll be back next week with more interviews with military veterans about their civilian career.